staff shirt. Uh, he also does a class, which he's probably going to talk about uh, during his talk. No, not really. Uh, about uh, uh, data recovery, which both some Ninja Master and I have taken the class. Uh, I can tell you that after five days of sitting in this guy's training class, blood was coming out of my nose and ears <laughs> because he crammed us so full of information, good information, uh, in those five days, stuff that I could definitely uh, go back to the real world and use and, and have many times since then. So, uh, what was it? Uh, was it? I don't remember Freaknik last year that I asked you to do the talk. Freaknik. For Freaknik, I asked him. He, he's done some real high-end uh, multimedia uh, presentations at DEF CON and Schmoo and Black Hat. Uh, and I said, you know what? Those are really cool. It takes a while to get them done. Why don't you do the top ten things you didn't know about your hard drive? And that one actually was fairly popular, and it made the circuit for all the big talks and everything. Yep. And he came back to me and said, oh, I got one. Raid my sight and sound. <laughs> I'm like, <"God." laughs> it just keeps getting better every time. I'm waiting to see the one you do at uh, DEF CON this year, which you may or may not want to talk about. <laughs> but uh, uh, Scott is uh, very, very knowledgeable on hard drives. And if you ever had one and you thought you'd like to crack it apart, check with him and uh, uh, get some good information from him. If you get a chance, take his class. Uh, if not, at least get on uh, YouTube and look for his videos or anything. It's some really, really good information. Um, so I'm going to get out of the way so he can get started. Y'all have fun. And there's no doubt that I'm going to run over, especially now. There's no way I can cut 10 minutes out of this. Are you kidding me? Run over, man. All right. Matter. <laughs> you have not seen this one. We're going, we're going to Seriously. Get barbecue. Oh, yeah. So, we're going to up front and lost it up. All right. What, what is this? What is this song? This one is Raid Reconstruction by Sight and Sound. We said we had to do it, Scott. Yeah. You haven't seen this one. I have not subjected you to my beta talk for this one. All right. Okay, so here's the story. I do hard drives. I do a ton of hard drives. I'm primarily dealing with physical recoveries. So I deal with the stuff that's like, you know, a, a hard drive got shot with a, a gun and there's a bullet hole through the PCB board or something like that. As long as it doesn't hit the platters, I'm in pretty good shape. Uh, so I actually do physical repair and go through a number of things, done some things for FBI and a couple other things. So, uh, so that's kind of the, the story in the background. And that actually precludes everything that's about to happen here. Because now the issue becomes, you know, if you've seen my other talks and you've actually gone through some of the stuff about physical repair, you know, it's getting kind of old now. Everybody knows that I do physical repair and it's, and it's there. Now what do you do once you've actually repaired something or you have some damage? Let's assume, for instance, in a RAID array that you had some really bad sectors. And that these bad sectors, you were able to actually clone the drive using some special tools. And I've got a whole bunch of other tricks for, for cloning things that have really bad sectors, even getting things ignoring ECC and a bunch of other errors, which you can go back and look at some videos and figure out. But uh, the issue becomes, all right, you've got some damage, and it's too damaged to put back in the original RAID array, that you can't just take this and actually put the stuff back on the controller and get it running again. So what do you do? Uh, you know, or what if you don't have the original controller? Or even worse than that, what if you don't know how it was configured? Let's say, you know, in my shop, I just get three drives in the mail, and they just say RAID 5 on them, and I've got to figure out most everything. Uh, in some cases, I'm lucky enough that they might have written the order of the drives that they took them out in. Usually, I'll know something. Usually, they'll tell me one thing or another. Uh, and this is typically irregardless of, of file systems. This is in between. I did a physical recovery, and I did a file system. So basically, what I'm going to do really quick is uh, I'm going to just kind of hit, and some of you may know some of the basics and whatever, but I'm trying to be specific about why I'm talking about it for recovery. And then I'm going to do a demo at the end. I'm actually going to. I have, I have DD images of a RAID array on my drive, three, three physical RAID drives, and I'm going to reassemble them here live in real time in a few minutes. So uh, that's pretty much the way that's going to go. So uh, demos are not what I normally do in my presentation. So you have flash animations in your presentation. I have one. I have one. I have one. This one's really, you know, this one's really, yeah. Well, a little, a little yeah. <laughs> nah, it's a, a little bit. You'll see. All right. So so anyway, so it's going to be a brief coverage of RAID what is not RAID and what you're going to screw with, then RAID 0, RAID 5, and then I'm going to do a demo. So I'm going to hit you with a lot of stuff and uh, sight and sound. That's kind of the point. Uh, the other thing is, is that besides assuming that you have actually been able to physically image this drive, because that's typically what you're going to do when you have a RAID array, you're going to take the bad drive and you're going to image it. 
in some fashion. You're going to figure out how to get that image repaired, get the drive running, and go on and go on. Uh, but now that you've actually got this, what are you going to do for the reconstruction? And then the other idea that I have here is I want to do this on the cheap. I don't want to go spend in, you know, I don't want to go try to do, anybody done RAID reconstructions before? Anybody in the room ever tried? Yeah? It's a bitch, isn't it? It's like the hardest thing you can do. It takes weeks to do it and get it right, but there are some things that you can do to get it, you know, fundamental. Anybody ever tried to use an in-case to do a RAID reconstruction? And it freaking bombs or something crashes and you spend $3,700 on it? Well, anyway, so I'm trying to do this 100 bucks or less. That's pretty much my point. How do you do this? The hacker way. So, <clears throat> So let me talk about just, you know, from a RAID standpoint, it's supposed to be a redundant array of inexpensive or independent drives. It actually started out as inexpensive, and this is one of them terms that gets kind of munged up a little bit. Uh, you know, then you take it to your boss and you go, I need this RAID array, and he says, what is a RAID? And you go, redundant array of inexpensive, and they look at it and they go, inexpensive? What the hell? So, so people kind of switch to independent disks and stuff like that now. Uh, and then the term has, you know, before 10 years ago, you didn't just find people having raids at home and stuff like that. So it's become a marketing term kind of thing where you'll go to a store and you go buy a Lacey drive and it's just, uh, it, it says raid on the box and they bought it because they thought it was redundant. So, so it's not. And so that's pretty much the issue here. And that's where you're dealing with some of these things like JBODs. Uh, so JBOD just means a bunch of disks. It is not a, it is not a raid. It is just two drives in order, concatenated in some fashion, maybe custom written software or something. Most of the time you see them and they look like this box. If you've seen these, you know, lacy boxes, you take them open, you got two drives or something like this. Now, and it, they change their boxes quite often. So in some cases they may not be a JBOD, they may actually be a RAID array, or you may end up with something like this, which is their NAS boxes. Anybody got this lacy NAS box, has a ethernet cable coming out of it? You guys have this? No? Okay, so, so basically what they do is they create like uh, two partitions at the beginning of the disk that have a Linux boot on them. And then they have the rest of the partition set aside and that's rated with the rest of the other disk. So you've got a little bit more complications. You've got an offset on the first drive that you've got to get past and then look at the two sets of data and restripe those things back together again before you have any data. Because if you just say this drive and this drive and put them back together, you won't have your data. And you have, some, again, this is not in relation to the actual file system, but you have to use file systems in some cases to figure this out and then to extract the files. But typically, like if you're looking at a JPEG on a disk, it doesn't matter what the file system was. Typically, it's still a JPEG and it's still got the same stuff unless it's something like XFS. Uh, XFS may, may raid stuff or may put it in, in out of order. So you've got some, some other things to deal with. And then you've got dynamic disks, which, uh, you know, in the Windows world, it's just bas basically they're just taking in a pending, the configuration at the end of a disk. And you can have multiple drives in volumes. And, but these are fairly easy to actually put back together. If you can get the drives running again, I'm using a, a piece of software that's 79 bucks. It's called RStudios. And uh, I'm independent. I'm not, like, you know, selling RStudios. But it's a cheap, easy way to figure stuff out. And uh, RStudios, if you put a... Uh, a, a dynamic disk on it, it'll actually tell you, oh, look, I see. You know, even if it's just one of them and the other one's not good, it'll still tell you from the configuration that you've got content there and you can put those back together. If you want to know more about that one, I actually did like a 10 minute movie. I actually reassemble them in about 10 minutes. So you can figure that one out and go on YouTube and find that. So, uh, so just to kind of hit just the basics of what we're going to talk about, RAID 0 is basically a strike. So your problem is normally, in a RAID 0, in most cases, you're looking at two disks. So you go to buy these Lacey drives, you got two disks. You can have way more than two disks. And that's where the problem starts coming in tremendously from a standpoint of trying to figure out what the order of the disks are. If you end up with something like a RAID 0 six disk array, well, you've got a lot of combinations of stuff that you have to play with to try to figure out what the order of these drives were. Most of the time, there's no sequencing of the drives. They use all the space on the drive, and they don't write a signature at the beginning of the disk that says, hi, I'm disk one. Hi, I'm disk two. So people pull them out, and they just you know, ship them off someplace, and they don't mark them. And so now you've got a problem of figuring out which one's the first disk, or even, in many cases, custom stripe sizes. So most of the time, what you're looking at is you'll have a disk, and it'll have a stripe size. And by default, it's normally like 64K. So your problem is now, well, how do I figure out the order, and how do I figure out what my stripe size is if I don't know it, and I've got to reassemble this, you know, munged up, damaged disk. So I'm going to get into that. RAID 1, hopefully you'll never see. RAID, it got cut off. And then RAID 5. Uh, once you get up into most of the others, so your most common that you're going to see is a RAID 1 and a RAID 5. The idea is supposed to be in, I mean, a RAID 0 and a RAID 5. 
uh, you're not going to see normally a RAID 1 because the idea was that it was mirrored and that you actually had a copy of the disk. And RAID 6, you've got another parity drive or another drive with distributed parity on it. So RAID 5 and RAID 0 are the two most common you're going to see most of the time. So <coughs> RAID 0, because it's a stripe, it is not redundant. If you don't have one of the drives, you got nothing. It ha you have to get some part of that other drive. So I call them AIDs because they shouldn't be called RAID. Uh, it's, an, uh, it's an array of independent drives that suck. So if you get that, and it's worse if you've got more of them. Cause, so you can just imagine, okay, instead of having two drives, I've got six drives. How bad you could get AIDS? That's pretty bad. So, so don't do that. If you start seeing that, that guy, normally they're using it for video processing. But these days, uh, I mean, people doing it like in Macs with software aid and stuff like that. It's a common thing. They just keep plugging drives in and say, give me a big giant amount of space so I can have three terabyte or something. Wrong. That's a bad way to go. No backup. How are you going to back that up anyway? But uh, anyway, so that ends up being the problem. Very, very uh, uh, prone to errors. Any one drive fails and it's over. So here's the pretty picture I already showed and talked about. And then that you can have, just as an example, if you end up having two drives or more, I mean, if you just look at this, once you actually get to like four drives, you can have up to 72 different combinations of the order of the drives. And if you can't figure that out, it's really hard for software to figure it out for you. Uh, there are some pieces of software. Uh, there's a company called Runtime who will actually take the software and run an entropy test against the data and try to figure out what the slice sizes are and then tell it back to you. Um, it works sometimes. And when it's right, it's right. When it's wrong, it's, it's always wrong. So that's kind of the, the gray area there. But most of the time, you've got to figure this out on your own, which means you're going to manually be swapping data dynamically to try to figure out what these things are. So I've come up with a way to try to do this kind of by sight and sound. Most of the time, you can figure out what your first drive is. The reason is, is if it has an MBR on it of any kind, has a partition table, most of the time it's at the beginning. It's, it's going to be in the first chunk of data. So if you've got, say, NTFS and you've got your partition table, you're going to be at sector 63, and it's going to look like this. So if you get this, that's the first drive. Normally, I mean, you can change it or whatever, but by default, that's the way most of them are because they format both drives and they use the whole chunk together to actually make their volumes you know, stripe together or whatever. So you can usually tell which one's the first one. So you get the first one almost for free. The rest of them you got to figure out. So if you only have two drives in a RAID 0, you can probably figure that out pretty quickly. <coughs> so, so that's just the information to back it up. So uh, ultimately, the point is, is that you're going to have to guess at some sort of slice size. So once you've figured out, oh, I got the first drive, I have three other drives, what order do I put them in? And you try to dynamically create this, you're going to have to swap through those three choices. And then you're going to try to do something. Now in my world, it's really easy for me to figure this out by trying to use a JPEG, GIFs, some sort of graphic, or even MP3s. Almost everybody who has a RAID array, even if it was just a basic install uh, of Windows or something on this RAID array, it's got sample pictures in it. So ultimately what ends up happening is you take it, you guess your stripe, and you don't, you don't try to reassemble the rest of their RAID. All you do is you say scan for JPEGs. And you can tell the identifier that you're going to scan for. I'll demo it and show you how to do it shortly. And then you extract the JPEGs, and then you look at them in size. So this is how you figure out what the stripe size is. So I've got two drives, and let's say one was set for a 64K uh, stripe size, and then they're weaved together. What's going to happen is I'm going to have half of a picture over here, and the other piece of a picture is going to be over here. And they're going to go back and forth between the drives. So it's not going to look contiguous if I'm looking at the same picture. Uh, we got fragmentation, a few other things. But most of the time, it's going to be contiguous space. So what you do is you extract these JPEGs, and then you look at what the possibilities for the controllers were. And by default, almost all of them use the same basic setup. Uh, and again, since the default normally is 64, some, some, you know, some guy's going to be sitting there going, I'm making a RAID array. Let's not choose 64. Let's play with this setting. You know, some guys do that. I, I don't know, you know, I'm sure they're for, you know, database optimization, but those aren't the guys sending me the drive because they would know that by that time. So, so what you do is you extract all these JPEGs, right? And you'll have a whole slew of different sizes. You'll have small thumbnails. You'll have medium-sized pictures. You'll get, you know, somebody took it with a 5-megapixel camera, and you're getting, you know, 2 and 3, 4 megs. So you can actually take a look at these files and see what size it actually works in. Because if you have, let's say, a 32K stripe, any thumb, thumb, thumbnails that are smaller than 32K are going to look fine. Anything over 32K, and you have to look at repetitively at more than one just to make sure that you're not looking at one that had a boundary at the time that it split. 
but uh, typically you can see it pretty quickly. The majority of the pictures are going to be 32K are going to be OK, then 64K, if it's still under 64K, say 58K, it will still look OK. The picture will still look fine, and so on and so on all the way through the segment. So you just keep picking sizes after that. So this is what we're talking about. You know, how do you know when you're wrong with your slice size and you can go and guess the right slice size? So, all right, so you extract one of these, these pictures, and this is the kind of stuff you'll see. You'll see it's completely missing this whole middle portion, and we want that middle portion. I can tell you, we want the we, you know, although a girl with a head right, I don't, anyway. Uh, ultimately, the whole point is, is that, you know, this was a fairly large file. We're missing a, a chunk in the middle. This is something that you guys can normally recognize. So this was a 140K file. These are the default samples that are like on a Windows disk or something. So, so around 140K, if you actually look at this, you can almost figure out, hey, look, I got a 64K. You know, it's about the middle of the picture before you actually keep on going. And then it continues on correctly. So I know right off the bat I'm looking at a drive. I'm looking at there's only two drives in this stripe. So this is a RAID 0, and the stripes are actually 64K in size. I can physically see that just by glancing at it, as opposed to trying to use some fancy way of doing something. And then if I get smaller than that, these are 32K files. So these are small 32K files. They're completely intact, nothing wrong with them. This is a thumbnail, and this is like 58K, something around that range. And this is a thumbnail. You know, JPEGs can have a JPEG embedded in them. So you can have a thumbnail that's embedded in a larger JPEG. So when I extracted this, I got the thumbnail, and the thumbnail was small and looked fine. The real picture, however, which was over that, it was completely screwed up. So I could not get this picture back in this fashion, but you can start to see where you're looking at. So over 58K or so, I know I'm at least at 64K. I can go up the chain until I get to 128K. Some of these rate arrays, especially the boxes you buy you know, off the shelf or something, a buffalo or something, might have a 512K slice. You may have to go all the way up to 512K to actually get these things out of them. And then uh, this one's slightly over 64K. You can see I'm only losing the bottom. You know, even if the other junk that was in here, can, can you hold the question until we get close to the end? Just because I got a limited amount of time and I'm gonna try to do a demo too, but I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. So, uh, so in, the sh in the stripe, as you're looking through the content, you can actually see, well, you know, in sequence, the JPEG's actually gonna look okay. Even if it continued on after this, it's probably not gonna display it. It's just gonna be crap. And so that's what ends up happening here. And same thing when you get into the bigger pictures. O over 2 meg, you can start to see that you've got some real problems here with size and things that are showing up. This is a large raw file. So you know, if you guys know what a raw file is coming straight off the camera, they're pretty large files. And you can see you know, the checkerboard status, you know, the whole thing. So you can start figuring out what your slice is. And then once you actually get it right, you're actually going to see the file that actually comes together. So 700K file on this particular one that I actually did. And then I've got one other kind of example. It, let's say that, you know, for the most part, somebody's just got like an iTunes library. Maybe you just don't find, I mean, it's going to be kind of hard to believe you don't find any JPEGs. But let's say they got an iTunes library or something. Let me, uh, let me play something here for you real quick. And hopefully it will sound loud enough. that it's here somewhere so and this you know the same idea happens with movies and other video files but movies are a lot harder for it to play consecutively and then so this is what it will sound like when you get stripe size now depending on the compression inside you know you got VMR you got different compression sizes for mp3s it may not be exactly the size you expect when you see it before and after but you'll get things like this where it's a mixed library and you'll get <laughs> and there's a bunch of that kind of stuff uh, all right so, so that's kind of my basics of raid zero I want to tell you about raid five before I do the demo so we can just kind of uh, let's see where I was all right, so RAID 5, um, you know, basically the whole point is, is that you've got multiple drives and they're supposed to protect themselves in a fashion so that if this, you know, one drive dies, you can replace this one drive. In the meantime, uh, while, while things are you know, happening, you can still run, use your server, still keep on going. Ultimately, that's the point. A lot of people call the drive a parity drive, which is actually incorrect. 
because it's a distributed parity, it's over all of the drives. So you'll actually get something that looks a little bit more like this. Now, I've simplified this enormously because I've had to give this kind of speech to uh, executives. So, and so I made a flash demo to try to help them along as well. And it's very simplified, but then I'll actually go into the real stuff. I'll actually show you what it actually does. But, um, and one of the other things too is I want you to understand about controllers. This is where the difference comes in between I went and just used my SATA connector on my motherboard and you know, put two drives together and did something with a controller versus uh, I went and bought a nice you know, fancy $400 three-wear drive uh, controller. So controllers, basically the difference is, is whether or not they have a processor or not. If they don't have a processor on the board, they're host-based. They're using your CPU. So if you have two hard drives, whatever that it's trying to calculate to deal with this stripe size and the content itself, it's going to use your processor to do it. So if you have a RAID 5 and you have three drives, maybe it's going to take up 7 or 8% of your processor. But you go stacking eight drives in there, the amount of calculations that this thing is going to have to do to produce the parity so that you can distribute it across the drives is going to be massive. It's going to be enormous. So, you know, you get these guys kind of saying, why is my workstation so slow? I got this rate. It's supposed to be fast and all this other stuff. It's like, well, you know, you got that $100 controller or use the one on the motherboard and you've got all these drives it's trying to calculate the speed for. So, so you have your discrete controller, which has a processor, and you have your host base. And what's happening in software when you try to reassemble RAID, this is what takes so long is that most of the time you have to go through this with software and it has to go do that math and recalculate things. And they found some new ways to actually, in the last six months, a lot of the software I've been using has changed dramatically. And I could do things in minutes now compared to what happened six and seven months ago where I'd have to wait two hours to get a result. So I can now actually get results in a timely manner enough to do a demo in a, in, in a room like this. So, uh, <clears throat> and here's the other real caveat here. You got to, the reason that you're looking at a RAID array probably to do a recovery is because somebody did something else wrong. So one drive died, your system was still running, and the guys just take six months before they replace that other drive, and dr another drive dies, right? You guys all heard this. This is ridiculous, right? Oh, the alarm was going off, but we turned it off, and we waited. Oh, now we can afford to drive. And so something else happens in the meantime. So now here's your real problem. If no one knows which drive failed in what order, because the only one that is in sync with the good drive is the last drive that died. The rest, the other bad drive, then is, you know, if anybody has ever actually gone into the RAID array uh, configuration itself and said force drive online, and basically it resyncs that bad data back from the, dead, the, the bad drive back to the good drive, that's what's happening. It's really just destroying the parity, all the information and everything. So I'm going to give you my simplistic um, uh, CEO version of uh, Flash. We'll see how you guys like this one. All right. So here's it's a little bit off the screen, but you'll get the point. All right. So uh, so this is basically my four drives in the array, and basically the each slice, and it's much more complicated than this, but ultimately the point ended up being, you know, the slices are added up, and then there's a parity that's produced. So we have a plus B plus C, so on and so on, all the way down, and you have your parity. And so that's how these are all distributed across the drive. Very simplistic view, but here we go. A little washed out. <sighs> that's just bad, period. All right, so this is my very simplistic view of what's actually happened in the RAID controller. And uh, you do get an alarm, but maybe not that alarm, but you get an alarm. Uh, you may get that alarm later. But so one drive is dead, came out of the picture. And you, you can understand it when you're simply looking at this, this type of formula where it's you know, A plus B equals C, and you just take what your X is and you figure out what it's going to be. You can reproduce that fairly easily. And this is what actually happens when you're actually, you have a missing disk in your array. You can actually add in a blank missing, missing disk and figure out from the calculations what that content is. So your content doesn't exist anymore if you have a drive that's dead. It's rebuilding that on the fly in the controller or in your CPU to spit it back out to you. So it's not actually a something in existence when you turn this machine off if it, any request that you make is coming back from the processor from that standpoint. So now, again, uh, like I said, it's a little simplistic of a view. So let me show you what's really kind of happening. Thirty-five, thirty-eight. 
All right, so it's not really doing you know, A plus B equals C. It's exclusive ORing these pieces together. So it basically, in order to produce parity, it takes the number of drives minus one, it takes all of that content across the slice, it exclusive ORs it, and then it produces a parity. And that parity is what it writes on the disk. When that's missing, then they just do the opposite. They replace the parity with the other drive, they reverse the formula, and they can figure out what it's actually doing. So it's kind of cut off here, but it's, you know, slice A, exclusive OR with slice B, and so on and so on. So it's doing all this math to recompute what it is that you get back as your data. And there's a couple of different arrangements that RAID arrays can actually have. And typically we're talking about a Linux slash Unix terminology here when we talk about them in these fashions because in the Windows world, if you're actually reassembling them, they're exactly the same thing. They just have different names. They just try to simplify it. So they'll just call standard, uh, reverse, continuous, and that's about it. So they just try to use like a, a standard verbiage for this. But as you can see, if these were your drives and these were the type of slices, this one's typically going to be considered a uh, standard. So you'll get, and it's called left asynchronous. Then you'll actually get others that are in a different order where the last drive in the row of the parity changes, left asynchronous, then there's a right asynchronous. I don't expect people to memorize them, but the point is you actually see these things when you're actually trying to determine what your slices are and what your order is. So there's four different basic ones plus all the others, dynamic and so on and so on. So, <clears throat> so this is basically my idea about steps to recover a RAID 5 array. The first thing is that most people go and say, oh, look, I've got these you know, good drives. You know, I've got five dri drives in my array, and, and you know, three of them are good. I'm going to go image my three good drives. Well, you just wasted a lot of time because if you don't get at least one more drive back, you don't repair it, you don't do the physical rebuilds, you don't image it, you got nothing. Because if you don't have X minus one as far as your drive, so if you've got five drives, you need four working in order to actually get this content back. Uh, you're not going to get anywhere. You can't. You won't have anything at all. So don't waste time and space trying to go image the good drives. Focus on the bad drives. If you can't get the bad drive, at least good enough. You don't have to get every sector from it. You don't even have to get all the sectors from it. I mean, just you know, even a good portion of them can be missing, and you can still actually reassemble the content. But what's going to happen is while you're processing it in software, it won't know what to expect. All the software expects the the, the content to be in order and to not be corrupt. So the software will crash when it hits those bad segments where there's supposed to be data in most cases. It's, a, it's typically uh, try, do, extract, and then after it crashes, restart and go through the process again. So, uh, so I'm at that spot where you repair your disks, then you go back and you image, you know, make sure that you get the bad drive image, then you get your good drives image, uh, and then you're going to go before you actually spit out this final image. So there's normally a process, like I take these three drives and I weave them back together and I spit out a new image so that I can extract my files from it. And so that's where we're at right here. This is the part we're about to do, is we're going to test the data and see if we can figure out from the data what it looks like and what your, your size and stuff is. Now, it gets really hard if you don't know at least one of the X's that you're looking for. So your, your basic X's are going to be you know, the order of the drives, the stripe size, and then the order that the controller actually did, whether or not it was right, synchronous, left, you know, and so on and so on. Most of the time you can find out really quickly about the controller. So you can get that X taken care of right away. And then if you have a limited number of drives, let's say three drives in a RAID array, you know which one's going to be your first drive almost right off the bat. So you only have two alternatives for your other two choices. So you can figure those, th those pieces out pretty quickly. So I'm going to assume that we get through a, por a portion of that in order to actually make that happen. So. Uh, so basically what we're going to do, if we we're doing this dynamically, we go create our DD images and then I'm going to use RStudio. I'm going to take those DD images and I'm going to put them back in dynamically. I'm going to pick my sizes and the physical uh, array itself, the order of the array. And then I'm going to extract these pictures, the same as I did for RAID 0. It doesn't matter whether you're doing RAID 0 or you're doing RAID 5, there's only one change basically that you're going to make, which is the order of the controller, what the controller is going to do. Otherwise, it's exactly the same process for both of those. And just so you know, that there's one other way you can do this from a standpoint of uh, kind of for free. Um, there is a Perl script this guy Mike Hardy wrote that uh, you can go and you can kind of modify and do your own kind of thing. He's got the pieces already written and laid out for you so that you can actually get your chunk sizes and do your own kind of dynamic test and try to figure it out from there. So, <clears throat> so now I'm going to switch over and hopefully video and Yep. Five demos. Oh my God.
Okay, so we're on the planet. Um, it's functional, but it's pretty ugly. Uh, it's 79 bucks. It does standard data recovery stuff. It does, uh, it does all the Linux, basically EXT, EXT2, 3, Riser. It does UFS. It does uh, FAT, NTFS, uh, Mac OS, uh, HFS Plus. So it pretty much does everything from that standpoint, in addition to doing RAID arrays. So for 79 bucks, you almost can't go wrong. Uh, it doesn't assist so much. Like, it doesn't try to figure things out for the most part. It will give you information and feedback, and you just kind of have to know what to do with it from there. As a breakdown of this, it's called R Studios, and uh, you can find it online or whatever, 79 bucks. Uh, so basically, you have a list of your drives over here, and then you have all the information that it's going to feed back over here, depending on what you're doing. And then a log, basically, that starts across the bottom. So now my first thing is, somehow I created a DD image. I'm assuming that most of you know how to do that at this point. If you don't know how to make a DD image, you got some practice to do before you get this far. Uh, or you're going to use hardware or software or you know, some GUI or something. But you'll, this tool will actually do it for you if you actually have a drive. But if you have physical damage and physical bad sectors, you're going to be struggling with that using some things like DD Rescue or something like that to actually get your sectors back. Or uh, there's a couple others that do like reverse imaging, like uh, My Rescue and DD Rescue will do it too. Um, or STK, STK Imager, things like that. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go take my DD images and I'm going to add them to this list so that I can work with them. So I'm just going to go and say open my image files and I have three DD images that are already done. Now I happen to know in this one what the order was. Like if you took the drives out, when you initially took the drives out, if you can get somebody to number them for you when they're going to mail them to you or if you're not the person taking them out, that's the most important part because you can eliminate most of your choices by making sure you know the order, everything else you can guess at and make it pretty quick. Uh, otherwise, you've got to actually rotate through orders all the time. But uh, so I can show you what to do if you assume that there's, there's, you don't know what the order is as well. So I'm going to open these three images, and it's going to add these three images to my list. And so right away for me, um, just so you guys know, on this one I used a high point controller. So I used a high point, uh, um, it's a RAID 5 array high point controller, uh, 374 or something like that is the chipset. It's the whole set that they sell. It's also made it into the Adaptex. Um, very few of the RAID 5 drives will have a signature either at the beginning. A Dell array will. Uh, there's a few, you know, a few of them will. But for the most part, you're not going to get a signature. There's an HP RAID array that will have a signature. But most of the time, you won't know your order. So you've got to kind of figure that out. So I know right away, I've got a partition one that it says it found an NTFS signature for. So I know I have an NTFS volume here. And I have three 8 gig drives uh, in a row and depending on numbering or whatever. So I've got these three images added to my stuff. So now I'm going to create. We have a choice here. If I was doing, uh, depending on which one I actually want to do, whether or not I'm going to do a virtual stripe set uh, or a RAID 5 array and the volume sets. So you have your choices from your setup. Basically what we're going to do is dynamically create a fake kind of RAID array in software is what we're going to do. So if I was doing zero or something, I'd use one of the, one of the others. But I'm going to do a RAID 5. So when I make a RAID 5 array, it just creates this fake drive that shows up here in the middle. And it's not always obvious what you can do with it. It's kind of a, it will do drag and drop kind of stuff, but it's kind of painful. It's a lot easier for me if I come over here and I say, okay, fine, I'm on my virtual RAID 5, and it's asking me questions over here now. I've got boxes I can try to figure out what I'm going to do. I can right click, and the important part here is that, yes, I can see my partition, but my partition is going to be at an offset. So my partition is going to be 63 uh, sectors into the drive. So I don't want to add the partition. I want to add physical disk. If you happen to have one that has an offset, like maybe the Dell RAID array has 128K offset, you can actually set that. It will be over here in the right-hand side. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go down and say, oh, look, I've got a RAID 1. I've got the first drive. I'm going to add it. So when I add it, it will remove it from my list. And then over on the right, you'll see an offset. If I decided that I needed an offset, maybe for the first drive or each individual drive, I could choose that over there. So again, back to the controller, you go and you look it up and you figure out what that's going to be. Uh, then I need to add my next drive. So uh, you'll see first there's also a choice at the top, add missing disk. So in a RAID 5, you're missing one disk, but you've got two disks. You can dynamically rebuild it here in software. Um, and you'll see that my disk, the other one now is gray, and it has removed it from my list. So now I can actually just go down and select the others and just add all of the ones I want to my array. 
And I can shuffle them around, move them up and down. I can turn them on and off. They actually have an on and off button, which is the equivalent to power and turning it off uh, and then adding your offsets and stuff. But what you'll notice here is that right away it has given me kind of a dynamic configuration. And I can do a couple of things. Like I can tell it every time I make a change, automatically apply all these changes to whatever I'm doing in my data recovery. So I can test like multiple sequences of, of tests and it'll just dynamically change them on the fly for me and I don't have to do anything. Um, and then you'll see this is based on the drive. So drive one, drive two, drive three, and you can see the slice sizes themselves. And you can move them around. Like you can actually go here and click on them and you can decide which drive it's going to be. The, uh, the parity, like so for instance, you know, the exclusive or of the slices equals parity. Well, they're trying to give you an indication here if they're pink. They tell you right here it's an invalid block order. So if there's a pink box, it's basically the idea that what if you selected this number and it was in this row, that that parity is going to be wrong. And so your calculation is not going to work. So you can try to figure it out from this if you wanted to. You can still force your own, choose your own, do whatever you want. It'll let you do it all on your own. But it's trying to hint and give you a little bit of a calculation and doing some, some work for you. Uh, so at least it's letting you know that. But let's say, all right, fine. For the sake of time, I could go through each one of these sizes, but you can see that it's already given me all my sizes for my choices, and I can just keep choosing. But I know that the default is most of the time 64. So most of the time I'm going to start with that and then try to figure out whether I'm going to go higher or lower. And you'll see really quick if it's a, a 512K or something like that, because all your pictures will look good uh, under, under 512K. It'll, it'll come up really fast, and you'll be able to figure out what's going on. Uh, so I'm going to leave it at 64K. And let's just assume that it's standard. If I didn't know any better, I would just say that it's standard. And I have three rows. The rest of it's all set up. So now over here on the left-hand side, it has now made me my fake partition. And it's now the size that it's supposed to be because I've added the drives together. And so it's bounding them all together in their fashion. And so I'll see that I have this 15.7 gig drive over here. So I can click on this drive. And there's a couple of things I can do, but I'm going I'm to add this one slower step here. Uh, I can right click on this drive and I can say, okay, fine, I want to test on my own visually what, uh, what kind of uh, recovery that I'm getting here. So I can go and hit scan. Now, the, the big deal here is if you have an operating system on your disk and you have, say, the MFT, you have a catalog of your disk, normally you could just go look at the catalog and you can say, oh, look, let's go see where these files are and these clusters are and reassemble them without scanning your hard drive. The MFT is the catalog of where your files are and has their names and everything there. Uh, scanning is actually the slower process, which says, hey, I've got a file header, and I know that maybe a JPEG has this file string, FF, D8FF, and I'm going to go look for that JPEG file and cut it out and spit out a file. You guys give it this so far? You know what I mean? So there's these two different methods. Most people don't know when they start their software which one they're using or even you know, thought about it. But most of the time, if it scans the disk and it takes 20 minutes, an hour, three days to produce you a tree, it's scanned. It did not use the MFT or the catalog. Or on HFS, there's actually a catalog that just shows you your files. That would actually work in a minute. You could just say, show it to me and let me see what I got. Um, in this situation, from this standpoint, I already know I got NTFS. I don't need to scan for HFS or FAT or EXT. So it'll just take me more time if I leave those enabled. So I'm just going to turn those off. And I'm going to leave those alone. And I'm going to go for some file types. And so I'm going to say I will only want you to look for these file types, not the 100 that are selected by default. Almost every application has these two or 300 that are selected by default, and they try everything. But I just want a quick answer. So I'm going to go down to my graphics tab. I'm going to go down and find you know, my JPEG and my digital camera pictures. That's all I'm going to select, or MP3s if I wanted to do that, or a movie. Uh, and then just take that and say, OK, in this case, I'm going to do a detailed view. Simple view does not refresh the screen. It just, uh, it just does the job until it's done. And you can stop it, but you won't know where you're at. In this tool, if I still leave detailed done, I can actually see when it finds files. It'll tell me I found five JPEGs. And so I'll know when I have something that's valuable for me to look at. So I'm going to leave detail, and I'm going to say scan. And so it'll switch to this screen here where it's going block by block. And as it finds stuff, it's telling you down here now which files and what it's looking for. And even while it's scanning, I can just like hover over a box and they'll tell me, oh, I found two files here that I was asking for. Or if I keep on going, I can find you know, however many files, specific documents. And if I want to know what they are, 
I can click on them and they'll tell me in a list what they are. And in many cases, sometimes this crashes. Uh, open in hex editor, it actually goes and looks at the disk and tries to pull it up. So maybe I got a false positive or I got something. Huh? Yeah, this is doing it read only. Now, you are plugged into an operating system that knows how to make changes. So Windows may make changes or something else may make changes. But I'm, I'm on a DD image, so I'm not making any modifications to the DD image. So this is read only at this, at this segment here. So I can actually go and pull it up and actually get uh, you know, my JPEG header. I know it's a JPEG. It's not a false positive. Uh, you, know, you could even go down and go further and see if there was actually any XF information. So I actually have XF information. So I've got what my Canon was and blah, blah, blah. So it's a fi it is a picture. So that means I'm pretty good. I can actually stop this now and say, uh, screw this, I don't want to wait five hours. So you hit stop, and it just stops this process, and then it'll come down here and give you extra files found. Now there's two things. Recognized means I found an MFT, and maybe I can tell you something from the catalog itself. But the extra files are what I asked for. Those are the things I scanned for. So I'm going to go and pull up extra files, and it just parses through and says, OK, fine, here's the ones I found. And you can go and see your list of whatever the files are. So I could pick a file and click on it. Now you could see right away that looking at this, I got something wrong. Now it is, the, it is typically the same picture. If you look at this one, you can tell, look, this segment's the same, this is the same, this is the same, it's the same picture. It's not, from, uh, it's not from another slice. It's not from someplace that's off. So I'm probably right on my slice size. I'm probably wrong about the order. Because the, there are still parts of the same picture. You can see parts of my video collection and stuff in here in the same slices. So in this case, I know that more than likely my order is incorrect and not my slice size because it's not from a different picture. Does that make sense? You guys good with that so far? So now, here's where the benefit of a program like this comes in pretty handy. And you know, live demos, it's always the same. Uh, it's not going to show me my scan information over here to actually make changes. Uh, after I've actually scanned some files, I can actually have to go back up to my RAID array and I have to make changes. So if I know that I'm probably good with 64K, I can actually do the drop down box and switch to the next arrangement or move them myself manually if I want to just shuffle them around. So the next one in the choice, since these four are the standards, uh, I would stick with these, these standards or move on to a custom one. But uh, so left synchronous continuous is my next choice. So I'm going to select that one and then since I've got to apply all changes immediately, this is where demos go wrong. Uh, I, when I actually go back to my extra files found, it redid the list I already had. I don't have to rescan or continue on. It re-put them back together in its order. So I'll go pick the file that I actually had and bam. And so in a few seconds, I can try to figure out visually where I stand with these rather than trying to use some fancy $10,000 RAID reconstructor, blah, 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 blah. Same thing for RAID 0, anything. Uh, so, and for 79 bucks, I mean, come on, really? <coughs> so, so that was my demo. That's what I have. Any questions? Thanks. Yes. Um, the Drobo is actually a very intelligent device, though. Uh, because you can put drives in that are different sizes, it will dynamically change the type of RAID that it uses on the fly. So it will actually figure out. Now, if you put four drives in of the same size, they automatically are RAID 5. If they're any other order, they are different. I mean, and I, I want to stick with RAID 5 because I trust it. I know what it is. And I know they have some pretty robust formulas. And I've done recoveries from them before. Not that there's a problem with that because I've done them from everything. So, but, uh, but. I mean, I, I like the devices. I think it's a very quick and easy, simple way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I just don't necessarily want to, it won't tell you what RAID, uh, you know, what the layout is that it's using. It won't tell you I'm using a mirror or I'm using a, you'll have to kind of guess because you'll know what your sizes are and what the output was. So you can kind of calculate what that is. But I don't like that I don't know. That's my problem, is that I don't know. If I know it's RAID 5, I know I can reconstruct it if you screw it up. So, or your machine smokes and I don't need it. Because uh, sometimes what happens is five years down the road, you've still got that device, but no one else can get that device anymore. And if it smokes, that's what's happening with a lot of Lacey drives. I've got like a collection in the back of all the boards that are custom. And because those, those Lacey drives, a lot of them are custom. And you end up with one that has like four plugs on it. It's, it's, it may not be standard. So you need to go back to that working board to actually get it running again. I want to know what it's doing. 
Uh, I don't want to be like the guy who buys it at the store and says rate on the box and it's really an AIDS. So that's, that doesn't work. Those are photographers, by the way. Yeah. Right. Well, when you're doing your physical recovery, like I actually use several devices, like I use a deep spar disk imager, it'll actually give me a report of the sectors that I have errors on. And so I will know how many I have. And so instead of testing just one picture, like I could have shown, you know, I could have gone through 20 pictures, but I didn't know for time whether we'd make it or not. Uh, I could, I, you, you have to look at multiple pictures to try to figure out if you're looking at something that's corrupt and then you've got to go look at that like I just did when I said, oh yeah, it's a Canon or something, it's not a false positive because you can have FFD8 FF in a row and it be a false positive and not even be a picture and be something else or encryption for that standpoint. But so if you get a list like this, like I got a pretty robust list, I could just keep going down the pictures until you know, I feel confident that you know, I've got five or 10 good ones versus five or 10 bad ones, whether or not it's actually a picture or not, or it's a false positive, or you know, switch to GIFs and do something small and see if you can actually get something small back. You can, you can kind of start figuring that out a little bit. But most of the time, you're looking at physical damage. You're looking at a drive that uh, most of the time, it's a, a, like a DMA problem. Like there's actually a memory problem on the device itself. And when data is transferred on a hard drive into the drive's memory, like you have a two meg cache, it transfers it into there. It actually has corruption coming out of there over the bus back to your device. You can switch to PIO mode or you can do it in reverse. When you do it in reverse, it doesn't actually use the cache in the same method. It only transfers one segment at a time. And you can actually, in some cases, choose how much you want to write out from the buffer so it's not going across the bus with 256 bytes at a time. So there's, there's a way to do that. But, but, but that's, a, that's a little bit before this. So, but I'll be happy to go through it or go watch my videos too. I've got like 50 hours online of that, of all that. So. Yes. Yeah. No. No problem there. Right. You can. It'll figure it out. It'll actually tell you or give you some feedback on that as well. So. Yes, and it, like I said, even for like dynamic, uh, you know, it'll actually give me the feedback right away. I don't have to go searching for it, like some other tools that you actually whip open a hex editor. Like if you wanted to try this in a higher end package, like X-Ways Forensics or something, it'll actually give you more feedback as well. You'll actually be able to tell and do this in a couple of seconds as well. Uh, and Runtime Suite is very similar to this. They actually have a virtual image. I can actually do the demo. No, that's not enough time. Uh, you can do the same thing in Runtimes. It'll do the entropy test. It'll try to figure out the order. Even though it doesn't tell you it's right if it doesn't know, you can figure out what it is pretty quickly and dynamically open it in something that actually is like a hex editor you can parse through, uh, through the NTFS. Because every NTFS record is only 1024 bytes, and you can actually figure out from the records and the cluster where the JPEG is and what you want to test pretty quickly. Yes, it matters from the order. There's like five or six different ways that they, the controller does things with offset, and then the whether or not the order of the, you know, which one they chose from the order standpoint. Um, yes, it does matter. So if you're using Adaptech versus, uh, you know, uh, uh, Threeware, they are different. You have to look them up and find out from the spec which one they're using if you can get that information. What about I don't know off the top of my head, but I mean, Sun, I, I mean, I'd have to go and look and see from a standpoint, of, but I could still actually extract the picture and try to figure it out from its format, but UFS yeah, UFS file system, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, it'll do UFS too. This won't be a problem with UFS, but X, uh, if you're using XFS is a nightmare because you can only scan. You can't use the catalog because nothing's supporting the catalog right now. And we have the same problem with ZFS, except the ZFS fragments the data and moves it around. So you've got to know you're on ZFS. And then you've got to take this one more step. You've got to spit out the image and then take the image to a, to a machine that understands ZFS and mount the image that you've extracted. And then go look for your JPEG because it's got to be able to understand it. So in XFS and ZFS, we've got a couple more steps. But yes, we can, and they're coming, I'm sure. We'll get something. Yeah. Thank you. Which one? OK, go ahead. I'm on it, too.
Yeah. Well, yeah, your problem is always the unknown portion. The, uh, you know, it's like not knowing the controller, not knowing how to dynamically create it. Not, I mean, but you've never seen any of those guys discussing this method either. But unless you don't know this already, they hired me for the SEC 606. So I'm teaching this now for SANS starting in June. Okay. So maybe they'll write about it. <laughs> I don't know. But that, I mean, I've, I've been through that a couple of times. I'm not going to say it's, you know, I'm going to blow by it really easy. This may still take me two weeks to actually get to this spot. I've got to do the physical repair. I've got to do the images. I've got to take them and phys physically. I mean, if you take, I mean, and, and, and Scott will tell you this, from his, uh, from his raid array, if you, you can saturate the raid array and you can have all kinds of problems and you have the same problem when I, you know, on a laptop, I go hook up four drives and actually try to reassemble a raid array. We're talking some CPU power here and I.O., so you've got, to have, you've got to have some throughput, and you've got to be able to do it, and it'll still take you a week to spit out an image. My whole point is to I, want, I don't want to have to spit out an image of the, all the hard drives weaved back together unless I had a good idea that was it. Because you used to have to wait a week, spit it out, look at it, figure out if you had the right thing, go back to the drawing board, and do it again. And two months later, you are whipping out your final image before you actually have the data. And that's what's happening in forensics is they had a good drive. They already knew it was good. They knew it was assembled, but they did not know what it was after they made images of these physical disks. But you can do it. I do it all the time. So, so this helps speed up the process. Yes. You know, what the order is yes. Okay. This is, if you don't know what the order is and you don't know what the configuration is, this, this is how you're doing it. This is a physical example of how to actually go through that process. So at least... I mean, I, I kind of made it up, so I don't know if anybody else is doing it, but it worked for me on thousands of drives. So, I mean, I've done probably 500 raid arrays this year. So, nobody told you you couldn't do this. So. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I knew that that's what I was looking for. I could look at the JPEGs and I could tell that. So, uh, and you know when you're missing something too. You know right away when something's wrong. So, I got a drive in the other day, and they said it was just one drive, and I'm looking at it, and I'm going, well, there's stripes. I mean, it's not one drive. And she's like, oh, yeah, well, he said it was a mirror. Well, it ain't a mirror. Go get the other drive and bring it back. Because it's a, it's, and that happens all the time, too. People go, it's a mirror. It's not a mirror. Uh, otherwise, we wouldn't be doing a recovery for you, probably. So that's, right? Any, Sam, I know you had something, man. You were going to say something. All right. Okay. Don't we buy this software? Do you come in the box with the software? I don't, these people don't even know who I am. So it has nothing to do with this software. It's the same process even if you use runtimes or something. Now I know the guys at runtime and their stuff is really great, but it does take a little bit more work to figure out what you're going to produce. So when they're, like I said, when their software is right, they try to do an entropy test and when it's right, it is right. It tells you flat out it's right, it's green. If it's not right, you have to guess. It, it doesn't mean it won't work. It just means they tell you it's not right. So. Or in you know in case X Wave Forensics they they do similar things but they treat you like you don't know what you're doing they guess and if they're wrong you're stuck that's the problem so anything else you guys good thank you.